I think he deserves three marks for that. <laughs> <coughs> All right, fellows, here's your piece. It's, it's called I Whistle a Happy Tune from the King and I. Who knows that? Yes. A university has three main aims, to teach the young, to supply the country with the expertise it needs, and to add to the sum of human knowledge. Having a good time comes fourth, and firmly in that category is the annual competition when the undergraduates and fellows of Queen's College face the music. I whistle a happy tune, and nobody knows at all, I'm afraid. When pa-da-dum, pum 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 Facing the music in its other sense also brings undergraduates to the notice of Dr. John Green. But Dr. Green has spent most of his adult life at Queen's, and as his tentacles have reached into the innermost recesses of college life, so his power and prestige have grown. One of his many hats is that of senior tutor. It's in this role that he's judge, jury, and executioner in matters of college discipline. Uh. James, your name was um, given to uh, the, to me as one of the undergraduates who were in the bar on the 23rd of February, um, which was last Thursday. And we've had specific complaints from undergraduates about the singing of obscene songs, um, beer being thrown over some students who are not involved with those people in, um, who are carousing, um, and darts and pens being thrown someone was urinating in the court, and so on. Now, your name was given to me by uh, two students as being involved with that, and I don't know whether you were or you're not. I was, I was, I was certainly there, yeah. Um, I, I sang songs. I stopped a glass of beer being thrown over people because I wasn't drunk. I, was, I wasn't, I'd been to Max Hop rehearsal that evening, and I came back and joined in the singing of the songs in the middle. Um, and realising after what you spoke to me about, uh, about throwing beer over people, I knew that's what, I thought that was really what people were going to get upset about. And so I did my best to stop people doing that, but it's not always terribly easy in that situation. So, um, but I, I agree, I, the beer was thrown. I, don't, I, don't I think you have to be held corporately responsible, quite honestly. Oh, um, essentially, for, certainly for part of it, for... Um, so it's singing, the singing the songs, songs is a, is a, a finable offence. Well, it's because it's because I have a, a letter here from an undergraduate who, who goes who waxes ly lyrical about uh, the effect of, of such a thing when he had guests in the college, 
in the college bar. Mm. He, there were, and there were also two guests of the college who were staying in a college guest room, old members, mm. who were severely offended by that. Mm. And old members of the college, of course, should be allowed to come back into the bar, in, into the college and into the bar and expect, and they should be able to expect a civilised behaviour. I think that I think uh, the behaviour in the bar has gradually been clamped down on in the last five, ten years. I don't know what it is, um, and it's a question of, of of deciding what kind of behaviour will be tolerated by society. You're a lawyer. That's exactly what happens in the in the world outside. The laws yeah, change. Yeah, but um, people tend to get told beforehand. Well, there's, it, really I, that, there's a difference between the kind of sing, the song, I mean, some songs which are sung, and for example, those which are sung on the Thursday night. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't like to repeat some of the things which were actually yeah. being, being sung about. Yeah. And I think I rest my case there. <laughs> but you're not prepared to tell me why you didn't once before, huh? I don't think it's a question of warning you in advance. I think it's a question of trying to steer a balance between what those. Mm majority of people in college will yeah, tolerate the same question. I know, I know about the balance argument. I want to know why you didn't tell us beforehand. You know that on Thursday nights after that game, you went to the rugby game yourself. You must have known it was almost certain to happen. Why didn't you warn us beforehand? I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with singing songs. I think there's something intrinsically wrong. You thought wrong. they'd be innocent songs, would you? Rugby songs, rugby songs don't tend to be like that. No, we're getting this a bit out of proportion, are we? I mean, one of the things that's been made quite clear to you is it's not a question of things, a whole series of indictable offences. I mean, so many rude words, so much financial fine, it just happens that we've got an increasing of amount of complaint recently. Mm. Uh, and this was one of the items which we've had quite specific complaints about. Now, I mean, that seems to me, it's, okay, it's a fairly ad hoc way of proceeding, but the mm. fact that we now ha clearly have arrived at a stage in which you're causing substantial offence seems to me to warrant some action. The penalty, a five pound fine. Later in the day, Dr. Green goes for his weekly routine with the president of Queen's, Professor Ronald Oxborough. With the latest outrage of the Rugger Club fresh in his mind, Dr. Green raises the delicate topic of peace and quiet in the presidential lodge. Right, where should we start? Um, I've got three or four things. Um, has the college been quieter? It's mostly Fridays and Saturdays. And what kind of time? Is it the kind of... Oh, I suppose 11.30 to 12.30, something like that. You see, that's exactly when all the parties and the Shop. discos and the bar shut. And, uh, it's a natural hazard, I think, of yeah. living, in, living in the lodge. The president has not lived here long. He was elected in 1982. When one lives in this superb lodge in the middle of a college, one is living in a goldfish bowl. Everything one does is public knowledge probably before you know it. And so it was going to am amount to a very substantial change in lifestyle. It's a marvellous place to live. Um, it's very central to begin with, so that you're three minutes from Marks and Spencers and five minutes from the market and Sainsbury's very close, and so that it's tremendously convenient like that. So we very much like living in the centre of the town. Um, I suppose it's a bit unnatural that you don't have any neighbours, that you've only got, got shops nearby. Um, but of course, there's always a lot of life in college for all the students. But it's not just student high spirits that threaten presidential tranquility. At times, it's like living in a builder's yard and zoo combined. Originally, you see, the president lived in this wing. This was built about 1460. The hall is here, which is a bit older. And so, of course, he had quite a distance to travel. So he built this uh, long gallery as a connecting link. Not like the, you know, the proper kind of long galleries in medieval houses. This was actually just a corridor. Uh, to get him from A to B. And uh, on top, he built some be they built some bedrooms, which would be presumably for uh, the president's domestic staff. Well, this is the long gallery, obviously, and um, we've got a lot of work going What with the work in progress and conducted tours by the architect in charge for his students, the president's home could hardly be described as snug. You can see from these windows here just how the building has deformed. And when you, when you come in from that end, I don't know if you notice, but the whole building has got a sort of sag that way. Uh, I was wondering just uh, whether you've had to replace any of this stained glass. Is it all original? One that's marked 1589, of course, that's, that's the college crest. And the interesting thing about that, of course, is that it's the, uh, it, it relates back to the Plantagenets, who were the founders of the college. So that really was the original coat of arms of England, as I understand it. 
It's a very odd thing, I think, really, being the president's wife, because you don't know what you're supposed to do. Um, I think you really have to just be yourself, is what it amounts to. Um, but fit in to college, which is actually a very complicated sort of institution, and you have to try and ju just find where, where you fit into it. I, I think that the fellows know where I should fit, but I don't know, because I've, I've n not been in this position before. Um, the previous president's wife used to say that she enjoyed being a VIP. I don't think that I, I, I don't think I feel like a VIP. I, I don't think I do. I think the cat's very happy. I think she likes it very well. She, she spends a lot of time in the garden. Um, she likes the undergraduates and they find her very friendly. She's now got a label which has her address and telephone number on one side and the other side says, please do not feed me because the first year we had quite a problem because if they feed her then she won't come back home and she begins to forget that she's our cat. The river is very beautiful but it's actually very noisy. The daytime noise doesn't bother me at all and there's a lot of shrieking and yelling, particularly if people are about to fall in under the mathematical bridge. But uh, I can cut that out, but the nighttime noise on the river is something else. It was certainly not displeasing to have the prospect of living in a quite exquisite house here. Perhaps life in this exquisite environment is not quite exquisite all the time for a variety of reasons. It is a superb place to live and I think that in itself is an opportunity that many people would find hard to resist. There are interesting uh, difficulties which arise from the architecture which no one can do anything about. I, I suppose one example would be that although we have an almost uncountable number of bedrooms, they tend to all open off each other. And so this is difficult if one is trying to put guests up. Um, it does mean that everyone has to go to bed in the right order and get up in the right order. This is, the, this is the most strongly grateful we've ever had. We get to know undergraduates in various ways. Um, one is by inviting them to breakfast in during their first year on Saturday mornings. <laughs> the first years we have in groups of about nine. Um, there are 130 in a year, so it still takes us a reasonable time to get through. Mostly the breakfasts go very well. It's, we try and mix everybody up, so we have um, mixed men and women, and um, we do have a bit of a rule about only having one mathematician, if we possibly can, because if you get a lot of mathematicians, it can be a bit heavy going. So we kind of changed all that, and so now we eat and cook on the same level. Breakfasts at the lodge were for a while enlivened by a happy event involving the president's Burmese cat Natasha and an unknown black Tom. <laughs> There's Toby once too. He thinks they're marvellous. Really? He yeah. has been no problems. Yeah. No, he, he, he regards himself as the uncle and goes around um, washing them each time. He licks their faces. He licks their faces out there. But look, people who have to go to nine o'clock lectures don't feel that you <laughs> do get up and go when you have to. Uh, Coming up to Queen's in the early 60s it was a very different matter to what it is now. The formal welcome to the college was given by the tutors when we all had to turn up in gowns and the head porter came in and raised his bowler hat and said, gentlemen, the tutors, and we all stood up and the tutors paraded in and began, sat in front of you, and they just addressed you all on all the facts and so on. And it was a pretty kind of... Um, uh, I mean, well, stratified is right. I mean, one was very much aware that here was the first year coming into the bottom of a hierarchy, and there were the dons very distant and all the rest of it. What we've all really been waiting for, Dr. Christopher Pantin will accompany John Green and Brian Hebblethwaite, wherever they may be. Times have changed at Queen's. A generation ago, it would have been unusual for a director of studies, dean of chapel, and senior tutor to frolic about in the student smoking concert. And it's remarkable that their song should make light of a student romp, recently punished by the same senior tutor, in which some late-night climbers damaged the college clock. Have to be quiet for the next 
one. It tells a story. I have to listen to the words very carefully. Away from all danger, sound roof for their head. The oxbras lay sleeping, no fears whilst in bed. Yet up in the bright sky ran a student's a mock. They were scaling the scaffold. <laughs> At an annual service in the chapel, Professor Oxborough performs one of his many official duties. And now, in conformity with ancient custom and in obedience to the statutes of our college, I proceed to recite the names of the principal persons from whose liberality the college has benefited and to whom our gratitude is therefore due. First of all must be mentioned with grateful memory Andrew Duckett. The name of Queen's first president heads the list of those remembered by its 39th. And first president, to whom is due the design and foundation... To the old members of the college in this congregation, the message is clear. If they too contribute enough to college funds, their names might be added posthumously to a long and distinguished list. On the third day of December, 1446, a charter of incorporation for a college under the title of the College of St. Bernard. On the petition of Margaret of Anjou, Queen Consort of Henry VI, presented to the King in the year 1448, a new charter was issued in which license was granted to Queen Margaret to refound the college under the title of the Queen's College of St. Margaret and St. Bernard. These are the founders and principal benefactors of our college. The names of many others are enrolled in our records. My principal job in the university is as a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences, and for the time being, the job is, is running that department. I also have a job here, obviously, as head of the college, and I suppose my third hat is the one that I enjoy wearing most, and I suppose the reason that I came into academic life is that I'm really interested in understanding how the Earth works. I'm a geologist and my third hat must be my research hat. Cambridge is a cyclist city, crisscrossed throughout the day by students on their way to the lecture rooms and labs of the faculty buildings that lie outside the 24 colleges. At the Department of Earth Sciences, 
Professor Oxborough is about to kindle the flame of geology in the breasts of 150 first-year students. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first lecture of the 1A geology course. Well, what about geology? What do we mean by geological sciences? I have to say that this is really one of the most exciting times for anyone to be involved um, in this subject. During the last 20 years, we have seen what the historians and philosophers of science call a scientific revolution, nothing less. The ideas that I'm referring to are those which are generally known as the ideas of plate tectonics and the related ideas which preceded them, but which were by many people regarded as outrageously impossible, the ideas of continental drift. We found a way to the mathematics section of the Queen's Library. Yeah, I've used it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a great one for buying maths books, partly because they get out of date very fast, uh, and partly because they're incredibly expensive. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the much the best thing to do is to actually go to the library and use the college library ones. Yeah. There are the, the, all the main textbooks, certainly all the 1A books, have got duplicate or triplicate. John Green's workload is diverse. As senior tutor and the director of studies, he's teacher, policeman, and administrator. A fourth and more nebulous task is his role as personal tutor, coping with students' problems. The important part is that you actually do try and make people realize that a tutor is there to help them. That, to me, is really very important. And it's something which I suppose I worry about most of all the parts of the job I do. Worry because it's the kind of thing I often feel that I ha I'm, I'm most unsure about being successful at. I mean, for most people, they don't use, I mean, 18, 90% of people don't use their uh, tutor at all while they're at Cambridge, apart from administrative things. Um, but for the few who do have problems, whether they're beset from outside circumstances or, or whatever, uh, a tutor can help. I remember the story of one student who'd been here for, for, for nine terms and he signed in the book at the beginning of the last term and he said, well, John, I've come and signed the book at the beginning of every term and I've come and had supper with you and all that, and it's been jolly nice, uh, but I don't really see that I've needed a tutor. And then three or four weeks later, his parents were both killed in an air crash and he was the eldest child left. And uh, at the end of term, he ruefully said to me, well, I wish I'd never said that because I now know what a tutor can do to sort out that kind of mess. When do you have to give up Newton Road? <coughs> On the 14th, so oh. I've got to find somewhere else. Of June? Mm. Gosh, and who's taking over? Oh, this, this woman who's living with the doc. Yeah, who's a holistic healer. She's going to set up a holistic healing practice in the flat. <laughs> She's a yogi. Is that the way to get on there with her? Sarah White's tutor is John Green. She's been invited to his rooms for an informal chat but there's an underlying seriousness to the invitation. The worry's not Sarah, but Sarah's flatmate, Susanna. I've been through a bit kind of runaround today because, as you know, if someone isn't in an exam, then the college gets phoned up. Mm -hmm. And um, we were phoned up at 25 to 2 because uh, Susanna wasn't in the exam. So uh, George Cormack, uh, who's her tutor, tried to, to dash around and couldn't because he was then examining. So he passed it over to me and I drove out to the flat. Um, and I burgled your flat because I couldn't get any Easily done. <laughs> it was easy, actually. <laughs> and the funny, thing, would want to. The funny <laughs> thing was that the neighbours were watching. <laughs> so they must be very used to it. Anyway, um, and, and so I just was worried that, in fact, perhaps Susanna was fast asleep or something and couldn't hear. Um, and so then I went back to the exam room to check that it actually got the thing, and I didn't want to walk in in case it disturbed you or worried you if you didn't know. But I guess you must have realised Susanna wasn't there. Mm. What, what's, ha what's happened? Has she done the others? What? Well, she's been going to them, to the others, but not writing anything. Has she ri written nothing at all? Um, she wrote half a page of notes for one of them. Gosh. How many has she had? Three. She's taken... She's had three. She's had three, and then today, and she should have another one tomorrow morning. Oh. Has she been actually talking to anybody? Um, do you mean professional? Yeah. Yes, yeah, she's, she's been... She used to see a psychiatrist a bit, but she's since been going to a psychotherapy group. 
weekly. <clears throat> and she's been going to the counselling service and she's been seeing her doctor. And she has spoken about it to her tutor as well. Right. So she went to the doctor this morning, did she? And he said, just don't go in. Mm, I think so. Right. Is there, is there any point in me or George going to talk to her? I mean, what's the... Well, if you had to appraise the situation, I mean, what's her paper tomorrow? Education. Well, <coughs> I don't think that makes a lot of difference. Yesterday was the one that she felt more secure about because she did revise it before she got this block. And she just couldn't do it. And she said it wasn't the paper. The paper was fine. She just couldn't it's do it. It's the same old block of not being able to write, isn't mm. it? Demonstrators will be coming round um, to see you and we'll try to find you hiding behind rocks and the like <laughs> up the mountains and we'll be seeing you during the day. Okay, so... One president of Queen's was offered the crown of Bohemia and refused it. Another was beheaded and became a Roman Catholic saint. The latest president of Queen's has taken 150 students on a field trip to the volcanic Isle of Arran. Now, you've had an opportunity to have a bit of a look at this on crop, and what do you notice about it? You... Right, now you saw pillow lavas down the coast earlier in the week, and this is, in fact, a superb example of this kind of thing, but of course, possibly a little bit older from what you saw, than what you saw previously. This is the rather exceptional formation known as a pillow lava, and this is what you get when um, you get the eruption of lava um, under the ocean. You get it around the margins of Hawaii today and along in the middle of the Atlantic and places like that. I believe that what we're training people to do here is very, is very important. Um, of, these, of this fairly large group that we've got here, a significant number are going to go on to be professional geologists. And these days, more and more of them the time of a, professional, of a professional geologist is actually spent working on a drill rig or working with seismic records. And what they're really doing is using this information to interpret how, what, what the subterranean structure is. And they spend very little time, or much less time in their professional lives these days, out in the open air where they can actually see what the rocks are doing, how they're folded, how they're bent, and so on. I think that this is a very important in fact, fundamental activity for any geologist to become proficient in. And he furthermore has got to be able to, to do this, whatever the conditions. I mean, people frequently say it must be marvellous to be a geologist, travelling all over the world at someone else's expense, uh, going off to the Alps or the Pyrenees in the summer, which is what I do frequently. Of course, what they tend to forget is that you're there on a job. And so really what we have to do is raise them to a level of a professional approach in which they are essentially oblivious to the conditions and co can operate under almost any circumstances. And this is the beginning of that. For you, it makes a change from the President's Lodge, though, doesn't it? Oh, marvellous change, yes. No, I have to confess that I feel much more at home in this kind of environment than I perhaps do in the more formal occasions in Cambridge. I enjoy this enormously. There is another rather curious thing here. Oh, well, no, it's just concerned. If you look in this direction, you see what looks like um, a fold, almost. Well, like Dr. James Jackson is an expert in earthquakes. He's attached to Queen's and to the Department of Earth Sciences, both in the domain of Professor Oxborough. But his post is only temporary, and his contract will expire soon. However, a permanency has just been advertised in Professor Oxborough's department. This may be Jackson's last chance of an academic career. The job that's come up here that I've applied for is is, has come up at a convenient time for me because I need to think what I'm going to do now. Other academic posts in this country are unpredictable. There are not many jobs that have come up. Jobs are hard to find. For lots of reasons, the job I've applied for here is a very attractive one to me and one I would like to get. If it doesn't come off, the chances are that in a short period of time, in, in the next year or so, probably nothing equivalent will come up anywhere else in this country. And I really need to think very soon about what I'm going to do. And so I'll probably be forced to look outside the academic world for jobs and, and use 
the fact that what I have done is, is useful to civil engineers and oil companies. The head of the college is also the head of department and of course is involved in the decision of who, who might get this job I've applied for. He's um, my boss, if you like, in two senses. This is a rather unique opportunity for the undergraduates in Queen's to get to know the president in a, in a rather close way. What and, of course, you? well, and, and me, of course. I see, see the other staff, including him, m more on a trip like this than I would otherwise, yes. It can be personally awkward, but I think that provided everyone recognises right at the beginning what the situation is, we certainly have at least three people who are internal and who are going to be serious contenders for one of these jobs. They all know that only one of them can be appointed. I think they all know too that we shall make our choice on the basis of ability and not on in terms of personal um, preference or anything of that kind. We're really looking for the, the best person to do the job. And I think that although undoubtedly two of those three will be very disappointed indeed, they'll respect the decision because we go to quite a lot of effort to see that it's done fairly. Is it made in any way more awkward by the fact of your being head of a college where an applicant is already there? I don't think so. Uh, I think one has to simply become used to detaching oneself and sometimes making very hard decisions um, that apply to people with whom one is personally very friendly. It's, it's difficult, but I think it's part of life and what one's paid to do. Field trip headquarters, a hotel in Brodick. Here, James Jackson can have relaxed geological conversations with the man who holds the key to his future. See no, anywhere. The only place I saw it was only was further down from where I met you, Ron. It was downstream. Mm. Sort of okay. There was a stream up here where it was all very jumbled. Right. What it would be like in a mist, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got lost. Well, I, think I, you I probably got lost would be up. short a few undergraduates. <laughs> had, uh, <laughs> mass defection for physics. I mean. yeah. <laughs> Back at Cambridge for the start of the summer term, three shortlisted and insecure young academics brace themselves for the selection process. Part of that process is a formal discussion with Ronald Oxborough, Professor of Earth Sciences and President of Queen's College. Well, thanks for coming along, James. The, really, what I would uh, want to say this morning is simply what I have said to the others um, who are shortlisted for this job and what I say to everyone who were considering seriously for a job in the department. I suppose the first thing that I have to make clear from our side is that appointing someone to a staff job is really a massive investment. Um, when we appoint someone, there's a fair chance that they will be here for a very long time mm -hmm. and the capital tied up or the equivalent capital tied up in their salary um, is um, a, you know, more or less what one would spend on the most sophisticated piece of equipment we have in the department. So when we appoint a staff yeah. member, it's a very heavy investment. The university has been subjected to very severe cuts um, through the UGC. And I think that departments are going to have to look very carefully as to what their overall yeah. research equipment um, and other research expense activities may involve. Well, I think in that respect, what I do is cheap. Do you anticipate that your work is um, likely to have major equipment needs? I mean, not, not in the sort of scale of money that I think you're used to thinking of in, you know, that some people come here <laughs> do you and want mean, mass spectrometers. Do you or much larger or much smaller? Much smaller, <laughs> much if any, smaller. actually. I no. see. No, well, I mean, the sort of, sort of work I do, it, I'm much more uh, interested in having the odd few hundred pounds around to suddenly be able to mount a field trip, which would otherwise sure. not be able to mount because you just sure. don't have the time to, to arrange it because things like earthquakes happen unexpectedly. Right. It's on that sort of level. I mean, nothing like wanting to buy a computer costing 100,000 pounds or something like that. Or more, yes. Or more. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not saying that I've found an answer to the North Sea. I'm just trying to... Um, 
Do you think say what might be happening at Depp from what might have happened at Depp? Do you think there still is a problem in the North Sea then? I reserve my judgment there because what, what the oil companies are talking about. As a final test, the candidates give a lecture to the whole department, a test of their knowledge and communication skills where any question could wreck an academic career. Presumably, the fault plane or the fault zone or surface is going to have different characteristics away from the point where the rupture initiates yeah. and plates, places where it just moves steadily. Do you have any idea on that at all? Yeah, that, that is a, a different side of this thing. I mean, you might well ask, why is it segmented into 12 or 15 mm -hmm. kilometers length, which is what you're asking. And the reason we think that is, is because the fault actually changes strike. It curves, or there's some sort of offset in it, which is a geometrical barrier to the actual propagation of the rupture. So what the thing does is it cruises along one fault, dumps all its energy on the next fault, which then breaks. You mentioned early on the reason you went to look at this Turkishire quake was because there were no aftershocks. <coughs> Mm. But I, I missed the point as to why, with the, having these low angle earthquakes, you wouldn't have aftershocks. Me too. You've still got a lot of detonation. Yeah, me too. I'm just explaining the, the historical accident of why we took on this earthquake. <laughs> 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 so I can't explain why. I mean, it's a very bizarre earthquake. After hearing the three candidates, the senior members of the department meet to choose one assistant lecturer. They got to come to our internal recommendation. Uh, concerning this appointment to assistant lectureship in marine geology, um, uh, stroke geophysics or tectonics. And we've had a short list of three candidates. During the last fortnight or so, we've had them, um, each of them give a lecture and be around the department talking to various members of staff. And it's up to us today to to decide who we wish to recommend for this job. Uh, I think I should remind you that this is a full teaching appointment and that we have to satisfy ourselves, not only that the individuals uh, are good researchers who are really going to make their name in the subject, but also that they're going to be able to play a full and effective part in the teaching of the department. Now, I, it might be useful if I gave my impression right at the beginning that having heard all three um, lecture, I think that there is no question um, on any count with any of the three candidates. And I, myself, am satisfied that they would all be completely satisfactory from that point of view. And I think that our main concern, and, uh, unless other people disagree, I think our main concern really has to be with their quality as scientists. The department discusses the merits of each candidate for nearly two hours. Well, we've spent a lot of time consider all the possibilities in every aspect of this question now. Are we in a position to go around and ask people their, their final views? We've just met. This is, sorry? Yeah, we've just, we've just finished. Um, this is entirely between us. Um, for the time being, but yours okay. is the name that's being put forward. Thank you. But I haven't spoken to the other candidates yet. Right, okay. So if you could keep it, just keep it yourself. Yes, okay. Indeed. With this news, James Jackson joins the Department of Earth Sciences on a permanent basis. Automatically, he becomes a senior member of Queen's. His place at Cambridge is assured. <laughs>